G'day, Tragic here, and <laughs> that was a that was a long intro. Sorry about that. I'll try and uh, keep that under control for next video. But uh, still, Chaos in the Old World, awesome. Uh, this is one of my favourite games, actually. This is by Eric M. Lang, and he's uh, quite famous for his LCG contributions, Call of Cthulhu, the card game, not the RPG. And, well, I don't think he's involved in the RPG. Uh, Game of Thrones. I think he's even worked on Star Wars, the new one. Uh, very, very talented man, I think. I think he, uh, he needs to do more board games like this, you know, and really, really explore that because, as far as I know, this is really his only one, as, as that I know of, that I've played, and it's awesome it is really really good now this is a, obviously it's a Warhammer game and Warhammer is a little dark for some people uh, but that actually appeals to me and I love the theme of this game this theme you'll see it when the game is running it's freaking awesome now this is quite interesting this game I think holds a lot of uh, homage, I guess, to these little legends here, Bill, Jack, and Peter, who created a whole bunch of amazing games. Uh, not so much Rex, just imagine that says Dune. Probably should have got the Dune box to do that example. But uh, Dune, uh, Cosmic Encounter, Borderlands, these are all fantastic games that have a very similar feel to Chaos in the Old World. They've got strong player variant powers so every character has all these weird powers and the games are quite simple like the the actions and the rules are simple and the strategy comes with how you move around the board and that's what's so great about Chaos in the Old World unlike a lot of games where the rules are very complicated like uh, for example there's a game I quite like at the moment called Luna fantastic game you have like 12 different actions that you can choose to do in that game every single time your turn comes up. 12, you know, or Terra Mystica. There's like 14, what is it, like 14 currencies in that or something ridiculous? I can't remember, I've already played it once, but there's like billions of currencies, like all these different values that you're keeping track of. And this game, like those other ones, doesn't have that. It has very, very simple mechanics. And it's all about, but the actual strategy is quite deep because the players can focus on the strategy. It doesn't get diluted through technicalities of rule interpretation and remembering things. And, oh, wait, I could have done that. And that's why I didn't, you know. So it's a strength. This is, when I think of how board games should be designed, this is an example that I use. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, you know, pull its chain too much. I mean, it does have its problems, and it's not like the greatest game ever made, but it's very, very good in my opinion. And it's an example of what board games should be, as in it is quick, it is easy, it's like hour and a half, two and a half hours to play, it's got a lot of strategy, it's got dripping with theme, it's balanced, like really well balanced, and it's not complicated, you know? The rules are like, bam, once you get them, they're down and they're easy so really really great game now this is a versus area control game and it's a little different it's a bit of an experiment basically I follow a YouTube channel by a bit of a legend named Marco Wargamer you probably know him and I know and there's another guy who I can never remember his name I'll stick his logo up here or something and Marco's, I'll stick over there. But, uh, uh, yeah, click on those links and check out their channels. They're very, very good. And anyway, both of them, they play war games. As Well, Marco Gamer also does amazing reviews. Uh, I think he's actually the best reviewer on YouTube. I mean, I'm not saying the Dice Tower and, you know, Tom Vassell and Metzler aren't legends. I'm just saying that Marco seems to speak more to me. He has very, very good taste. He tries a lot of variants of games. He'll play like kids' card games and then he'll play like 
you know, absolute break your brain statistics spreadsheet style of war games at the, in the, you know, at the next day. So he does great variety of stuff and anyway, whatever. Keep watching my channel though. They're not better than my channel. Come on. What were you thinking? No, but seriously, they're good. Go check them out. But anyway, he started this video blog thing. And in it, he talks about playing war games as a solo gamer. And he kind of challenged everyone, why don't you take one of your favourite war games and play it by yourself and just see how it goes. And I said, well, why the hell not? So I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with Chaos of the Old World, which is one of my favourite games. We'll see how it goes. This could be a disaster. It could be very cool. Uh, this is a, probably a good game for it because it takes, it takes variable turn orders and it doesn't require hidden information. There's a little bit of surprise because the turn order means that you react to other people's moves, okay? So in that respect, there is going to be quite a bit lost, but I think I can compartmentalize my brain enough to build an interesting game, or at least an interesting game for me to have fun and hopefully for you guys to enjoy as well. But the mechanics of the game um, do not preclude one person knowing stuff, okay? Like, uh, there's no hidden information, there's no counter spells, you know, like spells that you cast other when other people do something, all that kind of stuff, so. Okay, so Chaos of the Old World. Pretty cool. Let's, uh... Oh, wait. Before I finish, though, this is a four-player game, but they released an expansion a few years ago. This is about maybe four years after the game came out called The Horned Rat, introducing another Chaos God. <coughs> Horned Rat, Chaos God, yeah, right. But anyway, uh, they re it, it adds another player to allow you to play five players. And I've actually never played with this expansion because... Every time I take it out, there just happens to be four players, and the game is such a good four-player game. So I'm actually going to play with the five and see what this expansion does. I'm going to use... The, this expansion comes with new spell decks and new upgrade cards and special, uh, you know, event cards, which you'll see in action. So it's going to be quite different for me. A lot of the stuff I've never seen before because I literally have never played. I've had this expansion for years since it was released. Well, actually, not since it was released, but pretty close. I think, uh, anyway, whatever. The point is, I haven't played it. So that's what we're going to be doing. Right, so let's, uh, let's see how this works. Okay, so here we are. Chaos of the Old World set up. Now... I'll just quickly walk you through the way it goes and we'll see what's going on here. Now, this is the board. Now, the board is what causes a lot of people to have problems with this game. One, the graphic is stretched human skin on hooks. So that, you know, that turns some people off, but that's definitely a thumbs up in my book. But uh, what we are actually looking at here is a fairly busy map it can get it's a lot of color and that's what a lot of people don't like about it well, let's have a quick look at what we've got we'll just focus here on Bretonia now this is a single region of the map okay like this I don't know if that's all in shot but that's a location okay that's the whole of Bretonia and it has a little value here this is its resistance value and also its points value and what we're actually doing is we are playing the five <coughs> five sorry I just can't I can't think of the horned rat as a chaos god I'm sorry there's four chaos gods and a kind of demigod and we're vying for not just control but we are vying for who can destroy and crush and completely mangulate the whole of mankind into pink powder is basically what we're trying to do here and we do it based on regions and the regions are worth points now these little squares here are they in shot? yeah these little squares here you can place spells in them okay so the spell goes in here and then when the when the area gets resolved they get resolved but there's only a space only two people can place spells at a given time there's a resolve order so you can see that there's a little arrow coming into this zone and a little arrow coming out of the zone. 
And that tells you, and that moves you through the kingdom. The kingdom has a resolve order through the different, as you walk through the map. So this is sort of in the middle. So that's basically all we need to know about the map. You'll see more of it when it's in action. Now on the outside of the map is a victory track. First of 50 wins. Okay, now victory condition is checked at the end of a game round. So there's no instant victories. That's all very well and cool. What else have we got over here? Victory track, pretty, do I need to explain what a victory track is? I don't think so. Now what we have here is basically an event deck, okay? Events get pulled off the top of the deck and placed in here. If they have, they have so, some of them have instant effects and some of them don't, but they actually resolve at the end of the game round. And then the next round, another one's drawn and this will slide along here and it'll go into there. And these are actually active until they're moved off the table and they're discarded. So that is actually a pretty awesome thing. And there's new ones in there because we're playing the Horned Rat. Yeah! And we also have these things, Ruination Cards. So what happens is, as we corrupt the landscape and start driving people insane or killing them or turning them into sexual perverts or whatever, uh, the land will get destroyed basically and five of these will get ticked off and by the time we get to the five we should be well into the end of the game as in it should be over and these are worth points so when a land is ruined the first ruination card gets drawn and these are in order so the first card the first land to get ruined is always worth the less amount okay and it just gets placed there when it gets resolved flips it over and that that whole country is just destroyed you know that area of the map's basically now just a hazard to slow you down moving okay so that's about that what else have we got woohoo the dials okay these fancy dials these are the chaos gods and this is the horned rat expansion demigod thing okay now this is an order of power uh, so this basically a turn order, which goes Corn, Nurgle, Zinch, Slanesh, the Horned Rat. Okay. Now, as you gain dial turn victory conditions during your turn, you place these little tokens on it like this, right? And he'll have tons. He might have one. He might have two. And uh, he might have one. And he might have two or whatever. Anyway, and then what happens is, at the end of the turn, everyone who's put at least one dial, one, one token on their dial, gets to rotate their dial once. Okay? Now, it's very simple. They just go, whoop, rotate here. Okay? Now, as you rotate, different effects happen. You get upgrade cards, you get victory points. Now Nurgle has the longest dial, he doesn't win, because this is actually a victory condition, because one of these is, this says Nurgle victory, okay? It also has this little hole here, which calculates threat. Now threat will uh, affect how various cards interact with the players, or player, I should say, since I'm doing it all. And what's interesting about this game is that these are all different. All the victory conditions for these dials are completely different. Nurgle has to kill people, you know, just, that's his job, just, not Nurgle, Kron, 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 fuck. <laughs> I always, you know, because Kron has an H in it, so I always think of Krom, which is, <laughs> I don't know why, but I always say Krom, which is, uh, uh, what's it, Conan, you know, anyway, so Korn, he kills people. Nurgle corrupts people, like, you know, spreads disease and corruption. Uh, Zinch is all about magic. Now, the Zinches is probably the weakest of the themed monsters. And I'll get to that when I talk about the actual Chaos Gods. Then there's Slanesh, who corrupts all the nobles, and he was just a god of pleasure. And then there is the Horned Rat, who I'll talk about a bit later. So they all have completely different victory conditions for rotating their dials. So we're all trying to achieve different things on the board. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the monsters themselves. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so here we have corn sheep, right? And these are his minions. We've got cultists, the blood swan. We have the blood letters. That's his sort of go-to demon guy for killing people. And he's got a big, big blast, bloodthirster demon. And you'll recognize these names if you know anything about Warhammer. Now, these cost values, 1, 2, and 3, match this power line. And every time you do something, you move the power line down by 1. Bonk. If I just spend 1, I can then place a cultist or move a cultist or whatever. And then once I move this thing, it then moves to the next person's turn, which would be Nurgle. And then it goes right round, and then I come back and I do more actions and goes around. Every single action, it keeps going around in circles. This keeps going down. And when I get to zero, I'm out of actions. And then the board resolves. And you'll see all this in action in a bit when I start playing. But uh, Korn, let's just read out Korn's uh, card here. No subtlety has corn. He has no yearnings for beauty of form in his black heart. For he is the blood god, the skull crusher. Within his immortal frame there is room for rage alone, and slaughter is his only desire. Okay, so basically corn he is all about killing people. He more blood for the blood throne, man. This is what he's about. He just wants to cut people up, destroy things. He's all about, you know, basically, he's got all these nicknames, like Change, like the God Change, you know, from life to death and all this kind of stuff like this. And he's a, I guess you think, like, like he's easy to think of as like a, a, a God about war, but he's not really. It's a God, the way I look at Kron, uh, Kron, uh, I can't pronounce his name. The way I look at Kron is that, uh, not Krom, God. The way I look at Kron, Korn, Korn. Oh my God, I just cannot say his name. It's that H, I just cannot handle that H. Anyway, the way I look at him, right, is that he, this God, he's all about, he's, he's trying to, like all these powers are in flux with each other creating a chaotic balance, if you will, like, you know, and his job, basically, his, his holistic universal job is to bring death to life, okay? It's, it's what fuels him, but it's also what fuels life itself, because without the death, without the change, nothing can grow, you know, you can't, if you don't burn down a forest, you can't get beautiful new shrubs kind of things. Now, it's a little bit up in the air. I mean, he's obviously, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's probably the nastiest and the most direct of the Chaos Gods. Very, very simple almost. Uh, he's worshipped a lot by warriors and like, uh, you know, the humans really get into him. Because you can understand what this guy's about, okay? Not so much some of the other ones, like Zinch, for example. But uh, he's a very, very cool god and... Uh, I think he's probably the most straight up to play as well. Uh, his job is to go out and kill things and just burn everything down. Now we have Nurgle, Whoa, the great grandfather. Let's read his thing. Nurgle is the great lord of decay who presides over physical corruption and morbidity. Nurgle can truly be called the father of all pestilence for all for in his immense frame is the home to every disease known to mortals. Now, Nurgle is an interesting one. He's actually my favourite. Uh, he's what he's the one that I always thought was the coolest. He's uh, he's all about pestilence, decay, de corruption. Ba basically, he's the god of entropy, right? He's all about everything falling apart. You know, everything becoming becoming what it was always going to be, which is nothing. Like life and beauty and whatever, these are all constructs that require form, require things to be in ordered states. And he is all about just all of that stuff decaying and destroying itself and falling into nothing. And like, that is the ultimate fate, the unavoidable conclusion to the universe is this guy. 
and it man and like he, he he's also different to a lot of the other gods because he actually has a personal connection with humanity. Uh, he sort of loves them. I mean, he loves them in his weird, twisted, I'm a chaos god kind of way. But uh, his diseases and his pestilence, you know, and like he's got this thing called Nurgle's Rot, which is like an arcane disease. Uh, it's uh, he he considers this love. He considers this like he cares. That's why people call. That's why they call him Grandfather Nurgle or or. Uh, uh, father death and all these kind of things because a uh, father's death I should say because he's uh, he actually cares about humanity he he just is sort of just warped he, like you know these guys they're not evil they're more like the Cthulhu gods they're like they're just on a different level you can't judge them with human morality you know they're just like totally on a different plane of existence but uh, He's, he's very cool. Now, his job, unlike Kron, uh, I, can't, I can't say his name, it's ridiculous. Anyway, unlike uh, Kron, <laughs> he, he, uh, he, uh, his job is to corrupt the earth itself. The way his dial ticks, the way he gains points, the way he's going to win the game is by physically decaying the entire world, just... That's his job. So Kron's killing, this guy is decaying. You know? Anyway, so Nurgle, awesome, awesome god, like the the concept of Nurgle is so good and just so well done. It's just like all the stuff in Warhammer is just so good. It's it's really, really well thought out. You know, I mean this is like 30 plus years of uh, writing has gone into these guys, so they're pretty well fleshed out. Okay, so this is Zinch. Now Zinch is also one of my favorites. It's like basically it's Zinch or or a Nurgle. Now Zinch is he's basically knowledge. Or well, not really knowledge. He, they call him like the changer of ways. He's like he's he's all about well he's basically the antithesis of Nurgle. Nurgle is about everything going to this foregone conclusion, right? But he's all about fighting fate. He gets power through the variant possibilities of fate. And he's kind of is fate, you know, and knowledge, education is how you change your own fate. But this is all feeding him. So he is very, very strong. It's like arcane spells. He's like, you know, powerful wizards and stuff are part of Zinch's touch, okay? And Zinch, Zinch is one of the the stranger ones of the Chaos Gods is in he doesn't have any active wants. He doesn't want to destroy mankind, so to speak. He just doesn't give a stuff if it happens. Uh, but he is more interested in how we use our free will to make decisions. Like, and every decision feeds him. You know what I mean? Like, he's... Well... Some, so I, I have read some stories where they talk about him being the essence of inspiration. You know what I mean? Because all the, all the chaos gods are actually part of life. All life. Okay? Like aggressive tendencies, entropy for a case of Nurgle. And this guy, it's about the spark that creates sentience is in Zinch. You know, and he's got some pretty cool stuff. Like uh, he wasn't actually described for decades, and then finally the designers bit the bullet and described him, and it's freaking awesome. He's like, uh, he's basically like, I don't know, he's he's like an amorphous mass, right? And he has all these faces of all these thoughts inside his body coming, and they bubble to the surface. And when he speaks, all his body, all the faces in his skin speak but they all speak slightly varied versions of what he's thinking, so you can never tell what he's trying to do. Anyway, he's awesome, awesome, awesome guy, and he's, he's basically the god of thought, the god of knowledge, that kind of thing. Very, very cool. Uh, okay, let's read his little thing. Zinch is the weather of all fates, the architect of the fate of the universe. He takes great delight in the plotting and the politicking of others and favors the cunning over the strong, the manipulative over the violent. Yeah, he's awesome, isn't he? And now we have Slanesh. 
Slanesh, the pleasure god. <laughs> now, Slanesh is one of the le lesser known, I guess, or well, not really lesser known, but doesn't get as much press. Corn gets the most, Nurgle's very famous. Zinch is a little esoteric, so it's not quite as easy to fit into the popular media like computer games and stuff. And Slanesh, obviously, you know, because it's all about pleasure and pain and desire, you know, the god of decadence, is a little too adult for a lot of children, and uh, that's why it hasn't made it into a lot of uh, the popular media. I mean, I think most people might recognize uh, demonettes if they see a model of them, but... Uh, Anyway, whatever. Slanesh is interesting because Slanesh is the most understanding of life. Okay? All the other guys are separate from it. You know, they're very aloof. But Slanesh is right in the core of all life lives Slanesh. Lives in all of us. Like all our desires or all that is actually... Because these are like higher dimensional beings, right? Just like boom out in the freaking universe but like parts of them are poking into our universe and into us okay through these higher dimensions or whatever the point that's the way i imagine it anyway i imagine them like these are actually part of us as part of life forms and slanesh is one of the strongest not quite well, what's interesting about nurgle is nurgle can actually uh control people who don't worship him by just inflicting with the disease. He can actually control their fates. Uh, Zinch tricks them into thinking they're doing stuff, but they're really doing his stuff. But Slanesh is actually releasing the inner wants, the absolute base desires, that even the life forms themselves, and I say life forms because, you know, it's Warhammer, it's like orcs and everyone's susceptible, okay? Not just humans. But this is a human kingdom we're doing. And... Well, some of them are. Anyway, uh, Slanesh is part of the life force, okay? Like, we are, we are, we are all driven by desires, okay? Well, you know what a really good way to think about it is? Have you ever seen uh, Hellraiser or Red Hellraiser? It's a Clive Barker book. He directed it into a film in the 80s, I think. Made a whole sh slew, trying not to swear, <laughs> I made a whole slew of sequels and they're really bad. Second one's pretty good, but the rest are bad. But anyway, Hellraiser 1, Pinhead. That is like a demon of Slanesh. Demon to some, angels to others. Comes in, tortures people, tears them apart with hooks and strings them up and thing. And the actual soul itself realizes that it's in ecstasy, not that it's in torture. You know, that's Slanesh, basically. So uh, let's have a read of its thing. Slanesh is the master of cruel passions and hidden vices and of the terrible temptations. It is impossible for a mortal to look upon Slanesh without losing his soul, for all who see Slanesh become slaves to his awesome whim. And that's, you know, how cool is that? Pretty cool! Pretty damn cool! Slanesh. One of the most interesting but most underused of the gods. If you actually go to wikis and stuff, you'll probably find they've got nothing written for Slanesh because, uh, like I said, it's a little... It's not, not as straightforward, I guess. And now we have the weird uh, land gimp of the group, the Horned Rat. Now, I'll probably get yelled at by Skaven fans here, but I'm sorry, the Horned Rat is not a Chaos God. If anything, the Horned Rat is a manifest case, is, is like a, a high general of Nurgle or something. Basically, what happened is, there was this great big city, this decadent city, that was falling into chaos, you know, murdering, pestilence, uh, high science gone mad, decadence. All the chaos gods were just chilling in the city, destroying it, just consuming it. And uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. Something happened... Like something hit it, whatever. The point is, there was this huge mutating, mutating plague that went through the entire, t entire place and mutated a percentage of its population into these weird sort of rat monsters 
that are now called the Skaven. And the Skaven killed everyone there and then took over and, you know, basically started, you know, that became the Skaven capital. But what they, they actually worship a deity they call the Horned Rat, which is unlike the Chaos Gods, which are facets of life itself, the Horned Rat is basically a manifestation of what the Rat, the, the Skaven are, okay? So their deviousness, you know, their how to control things, how to survive, you know. They, he also has a strong plague reference. There's entire plague armies in the Skavens. Uh, and basically the, the way I see it is, the way I look at the Skaven is that the Skaven are kind of like cockroaches, I guess. They're, they're, they're the best at being alive after the Chaos Gods have screwed around for a bit. Okay, out of all the races, the Skaven are actually conducive to living in the environments that get created by the Chaos Gods, by what we're going to be doing to this world in a few moments when we start playing. So, and that's represented in this game quite interestingly because these guys don't have the normal corruption tokens and all that kind of stuff which you'll see later trying to destroy the world. They're all about dominance by just spawning like so they go into the areas and they become prolific and play become plague proportions and so they're, they're very the corned rat is very very different that's why i don't really consider him a chaos god he was he came out in like i think it was citadel magazine or whatever the equivalent was of white dwarf back in the 80s I can't remember, it was White Dwarf in the 80s, whatever. Anyway, he, he, he was at, the, the Skaven race was originally like a, a special print and play race for Blood Bowl. And then the Horn Rat was introduced as, quote, a new Chaos God. But it's never been expanded upon the way the other Chaos Gods are. I mean, you just heard me talking about them. There's some really awesome concepts in the in the writings for Warhammer about what these gods are, but not so for the Horned Rat. The Horned Rat is basically just the ultimate version of these rats, okay? And that is the way I think of the Horned Rat. I think of the Horned Rat as the life forms, the life, the, as a pure chaotic life form, as in like out of orcs and dark elves and all the weird creatures in the Warhammer universe, these guys can coexist almost with the Chaos Gods in a way. And the Horned Rat is like their, what they will become if the Chaos Gods ever do manifest, okay? So like if you go to like the Chaos world, like the worlds that have been completely taken over by Chaos, that is where the Skaven are strongest, you know? I'm sorry, I slipped in a 40k for a little bit there, but uh, most of my experience is actually from 40k, because uh, that's how I used to play that when I was a kid. But uh, still, anyway, Skaven. So unlike, say, so Nurgle's trying to corrupt the land, Kron's trying to kill it, Zinch is trying to find artifacts and like learn knowledge. Slanesh is trying to corrupt the nobles and bring down the great houses and the rats themselves, these guys are not trying to do any of that. They're just trying to populate the planet, populate the kingdom with their own kind. But uh, yeah, I still think the Skaven are really soldiers of Nurgle, basically. They're tight. I mean, they, they even carry diseases and all this kind of stuff. And all diseases is actually part of Nurgle anyway, so... Okay, so that's that's the races. Okay, so there we are. That is the opening introduction to uh, Chaos of the Old World, so to speak. <laughs> um, okay, so to start off, we grab two noble tokens, three warp stones, four peasant tokens. And we've got to play, replace two of these peasant tokens with Skaven tokens because of the new rules for the rat. Okay. Now I just 
Okay, so what happens is in order of power, which means we start with corn, we're going to draw these and place them on the board and finish setting up the board, and then we're uh, then we're ready to play. Okay, so first is a warp stone. Okay, so what are we going to do with a warp stone? I think uh, yeah, stick a warp stone over here in Norsica, somewhere not too good because warp stones help zinch and now we're going to choose a peasant token and this is Nurgle so Nurgle uh, he's going to stick a peasant token somewhere where he wants to let's put it in uh, Estelia and now we have a noble token and this is good old uh, Zinch's move, and Zinch is going to stick the Noble Token up here in the Border Princes. Slanesh gets another Peasant Token, and we'll stick this in Betonia. Actually, we're going to stick that in the Empire itself, which will cut the Empire off. We can only put one in every zone. At the end of this, there's going to be a token in every zone on the map. Now, of course, you trigger off different things like uh, Zinch wants to can only score points by placing placing units where these warp stones are. So we don't by taking by placing the peasant token in the empire. This whole five area is now out of bounds, basically. Okay, we have another warp stone. This is for put that in. I oh, will stick this right over here. And we're back to corn. We get another warp stone. We really want to spread these out. I'll stick this one over here in Kislev. I haven't got any of the rat tokens. Here's a rat token finally. There's not many choices left. Put the Atelia. And put a noble token in Betonia. Oh, actually. Zinch. Actually, we'll put a noble token in Troll Country, and we'll put a rat token in Betonia. Okay, so we are now set up, and you can already see how the board can be quite busy. We haven't even got units on it yet. Okay, so we are ready for turn one, and uh, I'll uh, I'll do it. So let's just finish the setup. Each character draws from their little deck three cards. And these are quite interesting to me because they're new they're new cards. Because this is the more more lived set or whatever they call it. One, two, three. One, two, three. Now there's no hand limits. One, two, three. Okay. So, well, that's it, guys. I will see you for the next one. I hope you like this experiment. Welcome to Chaos in the Old World, baby. Yeah, yeah. I will see you for the ruination of this land and the destruction of all life. See you next time.